I want to read the word of God in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. If you have a Bible, you may like to follow it. It's part of Peter's first sermon after the day of Pentecost. Magnificent sermon, no sermon ever like it, I think. 3,000 people converted at the end of this sermon. It wasn't a long one, but it was a deep one. Verse 22. Listen to these words, men of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth was a man whose divine mission was clearly shown to you by the miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him. You yourselves know this, for it took place here among you. God in his own will and knowledge had already decided that Jesus would be handed over to you and you killed him by letting sinful men nail him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. He set him free from the pains of death because it was impossible that death should hold him prisoner. For David said about him, I saw the Lord before me at all times. He is at my right side so that I will not be troubled. Because of this my heart is glad and my words are full of joy. And I, mortal though I am, will rest assured in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul in the world of the dead. You will not allow your devoted servant to suffer decay. You have shown me the paths that lead to life, and by your presence you will fill me with joy. Brothers, I must speak to you quite plainly about our patriarch David. He died and was buried, and his grave is here with us to this very day. He was a prophet. And he knew God's promise to him. God made a vow that he would make one of David's descendants a king, just as David was. David saw what God was going to do. And so he spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah when he said he was not abandoned in the world of the dead. His flesh did not decay. God has raised this very Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses to the fact. He has been raised to the right side of God and received from him the Holy Spirit as his Father had promised. And what you now see and hear is his gift that he has poured out upon us. For David himself did not go up into heaven, rather he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right side until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. All the people of Israel then are to know for sure that this, this Jesus whom you nailed to the cross, God has made Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were deeply troubled and said to Peter and the other apostles, What shall we do, brothers? And Peter said to them, Turn away from your sins, each one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven, and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and to your children, and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter made his appeal to them, and with many other words, he urged them, saying, Save yourselves from the punishment coming to this wicked people. Many of them believed his message and were baptized. About 3,000 people were added to the group that day. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, sharing in the meals and the prayers.
I want to tell you tonight why Christianity is called a gospel. The word gospel in the original English version way back in the Anglo-Saxon days was really two words, God's spell. And that's where the title of the show in the West End came from, God's spell. And God's spell means in Anglo-Saxon, God's story. Spell is story. And Christianity has been called a gospel or a God's spell because it's God's story, which is much more exciting than any man's story. But that Anglo-Saxon word was used to translate an earlier word in the Greek language, which means to tell somebody good news. That's why we call it a gospel, not just because it's a story, but because it's good news. Why is it then that people don't welcome it? Why is it that people don't get excited about it? Why is it that if we try and share it with them, they look at us as if we're not quite balanced? Good news? Well, of course, good news doesn't need to be anything new. That's important. There are five things that make up a piece of good news. First of all, a fact, something that has happened. Secondly, a fact with a meaning, so that you can say why it happened. Thirdly, a fact with relevance to my need. It must be related to my life in some way. Fourthly, a fact that can be applied in my life and to my situation. And fifthly, something that I will enjoy when it's been applied. doesn't need to be new, but those five things will make it good news. Let me give you a very simple example. When the weathermen said on Friday it was going to be a wet weekend, that was good news to some people, believe it or not. It was good news to, yes, the choir master's nodding his head because he lives in Woking and it's great news to the people of Woking whose water was beginning to turn green with algae in it. So low was the supply and it's good news to the people of Tunbridge Wells. It may not have been good news to those crazy Christians who like to begin Easter Sunday at (laughs) 7 in the morning on top of a hill outside Guildford. But it was good news to those people of Tunbridge Wells and Woking. Why? Well, it was a fact. There was nothing new about it. It wasn't the first time that rain has been heard of in Britain. There was nothing new in what the weatherman said. It wasn't new, but it was a fact. And there was a meaning attached to the fact, and the meaning was that that rain coming down was going to find its way into the reservoir. And it was a fact that had relevance to those whose water was going green and and going short. And it was a fact that could be applied in their situation because every one of them could turn a tap on. And it was a fact that they will very shortly be enjoying as they're allowed to water their gardens and do other things. Five things make a fact into good news. And therefore I've got five simple things I want to say tonight about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, the facts of the gospel. The very first step in understanding Christianity is to get hold of the facts. It's not based on fantasy or feeling, it's based on fact, is our gospel. And the facts are that on, in the year A.D. 29, on the 15th day of the month we call April, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a man of 33 years of age died. Not of natural causes, he'd been executed. That had been done by a group of Roman soldiers under the orders of the governor of an occupied country, but he himself had likewise been under the pressure of the nationalist and religious leaders of that little land. But the fact is that a young man of 33 who'd lived the best life that's ever been lived was executed at 3 o'clock that afternoon. The second fact is that they only just got him buried in time. In fact, it was touch and go whether he'd be buried at all because they didn't have a tomb ready. And there were only three hours to go before funerals were prohibited for the next three or four days. They only just got him buried. That's fact number two. 
and they were so scared about something he'd said that they actually sealed the tomb and put a soldier outside to keep it closed. Fact number two. Fact number three was that on the third day he got out of that tomb. And the evidence of history is as certain for that third fact as it is for the first two. And those who have an open, honest mind are welcome to study the evidence and will be convinced that the third is as well established as the first and the second. Those are the facts of the gospel. And we've got to begin there, but if you stop there, that's not good news. That's just a little bit of history, a startling bit. Something that doesn't happen every day, true, but this is a thousand miles away and two thousand years ago. That isn't good news to you now, is it? It's just fact. So let me move on to the meaning of the facts. Why? Why? I'm going to begin with fact number three. Really? No, let me begin with fact number one. Why did they put him to death? Why would they execute a good man? Why did they do that to a man of 33? Less than halfway through his normal span of life. Why? I know that the public announcement was that he was a traitor that he was about to lead a rebellion against the occupying forces, but nobody believed that for one minute. The evidence didn't hold. Not even the governor believed that, though he said it, and then retracted what he'd said, tried to undo it. But nobody really believed that. Jesus wasn't that kind of a person. He never had a sword in his hand. He never went about secretly. He was utterly open in everything he did. Going a little further back, was he a criminal then? Because at least he was strung up with two other criminals who'd been guilty of assault and robbery and crucifixion was the punishment for that in those days. Was he? I never once hear of Jesus taking anything from anyone. On the contrary, I find that he spent all his time giving. Nor did I ever hear that he used force, though there must have been many times when he was tempted to, but he never did. No, he was not a criminal. Why then did they do it? He was not a traitor, not a criminal. Why did they do it? Dig deep into the records and you come upon this startling conclusion. The meaning of his death is this. He was not put to death because he was a traitor or a criminal, not because of anything he'd done, but because of something he'd said. It was a very simple thing, but a very dangerous thing. It could have brought the religion of that nation crashing down and therefore brought the nation down to ruin what he'd said was I am God's only son and at the secret trial that was held in the early hours of the morning on which he died he was found guilty of saying that they didn't even stop to ask whether it was true or untrue. They assumed it couldn't possibly be true and found him guilty of saying that. Notice, not guilty of being that, but guilty of saying that, which to his judges was patently impossible and untrue. And they realized, as many others have done since, that if it is true, your whole religion collapses. You've got to rethink your ideas about God totally. And so they found him guilty. I say it very simply, and I'm trying to preach tonight as if none of you had heard the gospel before, so forgive me if it's familiar ground. Jesus was put to death because he said he was God's only son. And when they put him on the cross and succeeded in killing him, the test was on. Was he right or were they right? If there was a God in heaven and this was his son being destroyed on that cross, then God would do something about it. And Jesus himself had utter confidence that he was God's son and that God would do something about it. And he said, three days and I'll be back. If I'm God's son, you can't keep me in a tomb. No man has ever dared to make a claim like that before. To escape from death after three days... A man's mad to say a thing like that. He's finished. If he makes a claim like that and it doesn't come true, but it came true. 
and God reversed the verdict of the court, remitted the sentence and put Jesus back in this world. And it is because of the resurrection, because of that supremely, not his miracles, not the other things that he said and did and, or even what he was, the thing that clinches it for us, the thing that made one of his most skeptical followers say, my Lord and my God, was the fact that he rose from the dead. That's the meaning of the resurrection. It tells us without any shadow of a doubt who he was. Now comes a second question. We've answered why was he raised from the dead, but it raises this very important question. Why did God not step in earlier? Why did God let his own son go through the agony and the loneliness and the disgrace and the humiliation and the horror of death? Why did God let them do it? They were taunting God when they put him on the cross. They challenged him. And yet God did nothing. And you know that even Jesus reached a point where he wondered why God was not doing anything and said, Why? Why have you left me, God? So we're faced with a very deep question here. If Jesus was God's son and God vindicated him by bringing him back from the dead, why did he ever let him die at all? What's the meaning of it all? God must have had some purpose. He never does anything without a purpose. And if he waits in your life before he answers a prayer, if he leaves you in perplexity and doubt, he's got a reason for that. He's got a purpose. He's got something in his mind that he wants to achieve. Then what was God wanting to achieve in leaving Christ on a cross? In not intervening long before he did? Why didn't he come three days before and show Pilate and Annas and Caiaphas who he was? I think we can explore this by looking again at crucifixion. It is the worst punishment in the whole of the history of the human race for any crime. It seems to combine all the others, the separation from loved ones, physical torture, loneliness, loss of life. All the other punishments that men have used seem summed up in one crucifixion. It was the worst. I think I could say that that punishment would cover every crime that had ever been committed in men's laws. But I can say with certainty it covered every crime committed in God's law book. And we're beginning to understand why. Here was a man totally innocent of any crime, any vice, any sin, and yet God let him be treated as if he had committed every last sin and crime and vice in the history of the human race. Why? It's simply stated. The Book of Common Prayer of the Church of England states it in rather wordy theological terms, but listen. He made there by his oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And the Bible in simpler language just says, Christ died for our sins. Simple as that. We now know why he rose, to show us who he was. We now know why he died for our sins. That's the meaning. I've told you the facts, I've told you the meaning, and still it's not good news to you. It may be of greater interest. And somebody may say to me as they leave the church or say to someone else tonight, well, that helped me to see things in a new light. I was very interested. It explained quite a lot that I hadn't understood before. And if that's all, it's not good news and you won't go spreading it around. You won't go telling anybody. It's not good news yet. For the third thing I must establish before the gospel is good news is its relevance to your condition. It's got to appear that it has something to do with you tomorrow, today, tonight. And I can do that by stating three very simple facts about yourself which relate you to this story. Fact number one, 
you have broken God's laws. When God gave you life, he expected you to live according to his standards, and you haven't done. Neither has your preacher. And it is not that we have gone wrong through ignorance. We went wrong through deliberate disobedience. There isn't one of us who has not known a better way than the life we have lived. Not one of us. There is not one of us can say that I am now the person that I know I could be. I have lived up to all the light I have been given. I have followed my conscience and I have done what I know to be right. There isn't any man who can say that. You have broken God's laws. However much or however little you knew of them, you broke them. That's fact number one. Fact number two is this. You will certainly be punished for breaking God's laws. God is a just God. God is a holy God. And God is not mocked. We saw that last Sunday morning in Galatians 6. Don't delude yourself. Don't fool yourself. God is not fooled. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. You'll not get away with it. God will have you out of your grave to face the charge. And he has already fixed the date on which your case comes up. And the third fact that I can state is this. You are therefore going to die. For in God's law book there is only one punishment adequate to cover sin and that is death. And I can understand that. It's logical. God is saying, why should you go on living in my universe? You're not living the way I want you to live. You're spoiling my universe. Why should I allow you to go on living in it forever and spoiling it forever? And so God has said you must die. And that includes not only physical death which separates you from people, but spiritual death which separates you from God. And there's only one man knows how horrible that is, and that's Jesus, to be separated altogether from God. Those three facts make the gospel relevant. If I just put it into one question, you'll see the connection. The question is this. Would God accept Christ's death in lieu of mine? And that's the big question. He's paid it. He's suffered the supreme penalty. God has not abolished capital punishment, even if men have. God has not, and Jesus has paid it. Would God accept that for me? Would he say to me, you needn't pay, it's been paid? Would he say that? If so, then the cross suddenly becomes more relevant to me than my evening meal tonight. It becomes more relevant to me than my bank balance. It becomes more relevant to me than my career or my pension. It becomes more relevant to me than anything else on which I rely for my future. If that's true. And the good news is it is true. Provided you move on to step four. Application. Application. It's no use a loudspeaker van going round the street saying... The water is now in the reservoir. You can use it. And people shouting hallelujah but not turning their taps on. No use at all. I've told you the facts of the gospel. I've given you the meaning of the gospel. I've shown you the relevance of the gospel. But you can go as far as that and still it's not good news and still you wouldn't share it with anybody else because it's not good news to you yet. It's maybe more interesting than ever and you begin to see the point of preaching and you begin to see that telling the old, old story that's 2,000 years old is not a waste of time. It's the most relevant thing that anybody could be doing in this 20th century with all its science and all its education. Application. Well, now there's a gentleman sitting in the congregation tonight who came into my study upstairs here one morning last week and he brought disease into that study he brought a tiny little plastic tube and he told me it was full of virus tiny little tube that was a fact 
The man came into my study with disease in a, in a little plastic flask. Fact. The meaning of the fact? He said that diseased, those virus have been taken from an animal, from a calf. A calf that has been itself diseased with cowpox. And we have taken some of the virus from that calf. And there it is. There it was on my desk. And the meaning of it is that taking that virus and putting it in a human's body develops antibodies against smallpox. That was the meaning of the fact. The relevance of the fact is that both that gentleman who is a doctor and myself will be, God willing, next a week tomorrow in Jerusalem and we will not get in unless we have smallpox antibodies in our body that's the relevance of it and so I began to see the fact its meaning and its relevance to my condition but then came the fatal words roll up your sleeve <laughs> now I could say now look up to now you've carried me all the way I find it most interesting. But will it hurt? I gather you have to dig in to get it right in and you'll draw blood. And I can't stand the sight of blood anyway. And it might produce a rash and it might make me itch and it might even produce worse and make me feel quite ill. And I could have said all that. My friend could have left the room and taken it away. But I rolled my sleeve up and he scratched that stuff into my arm and it is itching and there is a bit of a rash but I'm still feeling reasonably well and I'm going a week tomorrow application do you know you can preach the gospel and you can listen to it till you're blue in the face but until you roll up your sleeve until you say I know you've got to get it in me I know it may hurt and I've never liked people who keep singing and talking about the blood. But never mind. I need it. Because I know I'll never get into the heavenly Jerusalem until I've had it. That's application. And that's why the only people in this building tonight who are safe for the future are those who've applied the gospel to themselves. How do you do that? Rolling up your sleeve? No. Lay bare your heart, yes, but how do you do it? Listen to Peter's clear instructions when he preached the gospel on that Pentecost day and he made the facts clear and the meaning clear and the relevance clear. They said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Utterly clear. I can put it another way, however. He's saying, have your own Easter. Apply Easter to your own life. For what is Easter? It's death, burial, resurrection. And what is repentance but a death? It's a death to your old life. It's a death to yourself. It's to finish with the life you've lived. It's to be as good as dead to all that lies behind you. Repentance is a death. And what is baptism but a burial and a resurrection? Peter is saying, go through Easter. Have your own Easter. Let Easter be part of your experience. Jesus died and was buried and raised for you. Now you die to your life. You be buried and you be raised for what is baptism but being buried with Christ and being raised with Christ. It's a little Easter we're seeing tonight. These six folk are going to have their own Easter. That's applying it. That's taking the gospel right into your system. Repent and be baptized. Nothing could be clearer. But what about the last? The fifth thing that makes it good news is to enjoy what happens. To enjoy what happens. And there are two things that Peter promises for the deepest spiritual enjoyment of the people who apply the gospel. 
He doesn't stop with the application. He says, when you repent and are baptized, when you die to the past and are buried and raised, when you have your own Easter, you'll be like Jesus. It was painful to die. It was painful to cut life. It was painful to cut the relationships. It was painful, but for the joy that was set before him. And the joy that is set before us in our personal Easter is composed of many, many blessings, but primarily, says Peter, of two wonderful facts. Number one, you will receive forgiveness of sins. What a lovely thing that is. The older we get, the more we need it, for the more we have on our conscience. And the guiltier we feel, the more, as David said in one of his Psalms, when I did not confess my sin, I wasted away, I was miserable. Maybe a lot of the misery in the world is due to just this, that people don't know where to find forgiveness. And so they go around carrying an ever greater burden of lost opportunities and disappointed hopes and guilt and fear and shame, looking back over the mess they've made of life. And there's a blessing waiting the other side of their personal Easter, forgiveness of sins. And it's a forgiveness that goes on every day. To know what to do with your failures. To know where to take your mistakes. To know how to deal with your sins and have them not only forgiven but forgotten. And to know that God has put them behind his back and won't ever look at them again. That's the first blessing. The other thing that we enjoy when we've received and applied the gospel is something positive. Forgiveness is negative. It deals with the past. It takes something away that shouldn't be there. But the positive is, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Imagine it, a person to live with you now forever. A person to live in your heart, a person to stand by you, a person to strengthen you when you're weak, a person to be literally, and I say this reverently, God's antibody within your body against evil. To be vaccinated against evil. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. To have an antibody within you fighting for you. To have an advocate, a comforter, a friend, someone who will teach, someone who will tell you what to say when you're back against the wall, and someone who at the very last will take your mortal body and quicken it from the grave and see you get to glory. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Someone who will give you gifts that you never had before so that you can exercise a helpful ministry towards others in need. Someone who will produce facets or fruits within your character and personality that were never there before. What, a, what an enjoyable blessing. And that's what makes it good news. I've taken you right round the circle from fact back to fact. The facts of the gospel, Jesus died on a cross, was buried, rose again the third day. The meaning of the gospel, he died for our sins and rose because he was God's son. The relevance of the gospel, you have broken God's laws. You will certainly be punished and therefore you will die. But the application of the gospel... God will accept Jesus' death instead of yours if you will repent and be baptized and have your own Easter. And the enjoyment of the gospel, forgiveness of sins, and the gift of God's Holy Spirit. What more could I say? That's good news. And that is the news for April the 22nd, 1973 and for every other day until Jesus Christ comes back. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for everybody who's heard the gospel today and who will yet hear it. We thank you even more for those who've applied it 
and are enjoying it. We thank you for these six young people who have applied it to themselves and we pray that they may go on applying it living in Easter perpetually until they grow up to the full measure of the stature of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that the gospel is simple so that all of us can understand it. We thank you that it's good news, wonderful news, even though it's been told so many times. Lord, I just pray that it may be good news to someone here tonight. We ask this for your name's sake. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn now in which we identify ourselves with the six candidates for baptism. It is a hymn for them particularly in which they identify with Christ in his death and resurrection. But we can do the same with them in spirit. Master, we thy footsteps follow. We thy word obey, hear us thy dear name confessing while we pray. Now into thy death baptized, we ourselves would be dead to all the sin that made thy Calvary. Rising with thee, make us like thee, in thy love and care, in thy zeal and in thy labor, and thy prayer. Let the love that knows no failing cast out all our fears. Let thy pure and faithful spirit fill our years till we hear the trumpets sounding on the other side, and forever in thy heaven we abide. 296. Mm -hmm. 